In this video, we are going to be finishing the topics in Chapter 4. First, let's discuss some of the roles that, that proteins play in biological systems. Proteins are in charge of catalyzing chemical reactions, specifically enzymes are going to be the type of proteins that are going to be able to catalyze biological reactions. Understand that their role as catalyst is to lower the activation energy of the reaction so we can go from reactant to product in a faster way. So understand that catalysts, similar to what we know in chemistry, are going to be speeding the rate of the reaction. Proteins also allow substances to enter and to exit from the cell. And we see this in integral proteins. Integral proteins are going to be one of the different motifs or the different components, if we want to say, of the membrane of the cell. We also see that proteins provide structural components. So for example, we got collagen or keratin, which are fibrous proteins that are important um, structural components. Proteins can also transport substances in the body. And we see this as lipoproteins are going to be transporting cholesterol. So when we talk about uh, the lipids chapter, this is a topic that we're going to revisit. And we already introduced the idea that hemoglobin is going to be in charge of transporting oxygen in cells. We also know that they can act as chemical signals. So as you can see here, um, growth hormones, insulin, are going to be protein that are going to be regulating um, the body. Insulin, for example, is the one that regulates the entrance of sugar into the cell. Proteins also stimulate the immune response. So for example, we have immunoglobulins, which are activated as part of the immune response. And lastly, we know that proteins are in charge of muscle movement. So we have direct proteins that are directing this, for example, actin or myosin. When it comes to the shape specifically of the overall protein, we have two classes of uh, proteins. Proteins can be filaments, as you can see on the left image, or they can be globular, like you can see in the second image, the one that is on the right. When it comes to fibrous proteins, understand that they have long fibers and they are long polypeptides, and they are along one axis. Understand that fibrous proteins tend to be actually strong, and they are insoluble in water. They are going to be an important feature of connective tissues like cartilage, bone, skin. And if we look at the shape of them, as you can see for the example that we have on the right side of the slide, keratin, which is a fibrous protein, is made of many alpha helices. When it comes to globular proteins, understand that the name of it, globular, comes from the idea that they form spherical shapes. Most proteins are globular in shape. And understand that they have both alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Now, one difference between fibrous proteins and globular proteins is that they are soluble in water. So, you really see in these globular proteins the interaction between hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions in which, as we have talked about before, the hydrophobic residues are going to be trapped inside of the protein, while the hydrophilic residues are going to be exposed outside such that they can interact with water. Now, why most of the proteins are going to be globular in shape? Because as you can see from the fourth bullet point, many of the roles that proteins play inside the cell are carried by these type of proteins. Synthesis, transport, metabolism, just to name a few. 
Proteins can also be classified by function. And as you can see, I'm going to give you the categories for the different functions of proteins. So understand that based on function, a protein can be classified as structural. And pretty much what you have is that a structural protein is going to provide structural components. They can even be involved in giving the cell or organelles shape. As you can see, an example of a structural protein is collagen. We can also have contractile proteins. And when it comes to contractile proteins, they are going to be the generators of muscle contractions. They're going to be directly involved in what makes the muscle move. Some of the proteins that are involved in these include myosin, tropomyosin, troponin, actin, and of course we have an actin binding site as part of the whole system. But active sites is something that we're going to talk later in the semester. To continue talking about the protein classification based on function, we can also have proteins that are transport proteins. Those are the ones that carry essential substances throughout the body. And we have kept on talking about, for example, hemoglobin, which is the one that is in charge of carrying oxygen in the body through the red blood cells. We can also have storage proteins, and those are the ones that are going to store nutrients. To give you an example, if we look at milk, milk is composed of two separate types of protein, whey proteins and casein. And as you can see, they're also distributed in different amounts inside of milk. We can also have hormonal proteins and hormonal proteins specifically regulate body metabolism and the nervous system. As you can see, the example that we have here is human insulin, which is the main protein that is in charge on regulating the utilization of sugar in cells. We also can have proteins that are going to be involved in the catalysis of reactions, and those are known as enzymes. For example, here we have the, um, the example of trypsin, which specifically is going to be a hydrolysis enzyme that we observed in previous chapters. And as you may remember, overall, what this protein is doing is specifically is that it is hydrolyzing this amide bond. And when it separates, is generating a carboxylic acid which I'm highlighting in green. And it's also forming an amine, which means that in this hydrolysis, trypsin is just hydrolyzing amide bonds. And it does that after the residue lysine or arginine. The last type of classification of proteins based on function is specifically immunoglobulins. And understand that immunoglobulins, their job is to recognize and destroy foreign substances. Proteins can also undergo different changes. And one of those changes is actually denaturation. Denaturation occurs when there is a disruption in the interactions between the side chains in a protein. But understand that this is only one layer of it. Because as we look through the different things that it can, um, or the different denaturing agents that are available out there, you will see that it mainly affects the secondary and the tertiary structure of a protein. So think about it. If it, it, it actually interacts with the secondary structure, any higher order, 
meaning tertiary quaternary, will also be affected. But notice that because denaturation results in unfolding of the protein, one of the issues that this creates is that there's at times no reconfiguration and it can actually lead for the uh, to the, for the protein to be uh, permanently denatured. In addition to that, notice that most of these denaturing agents do not affect the primary structure. To give you an example of a denaturing condition, when we have an egg and we fry it in order to eat it, one of the things that is happening there is that through heat, we are denaturing the proteins present in the egg. But now, let's go over the different denaturing agents that can be exposed um, in the context of a protein and we're gonna see what happens overall. So as you can see, the first type of denaturing agent that we have in our list is heat above 50 degrees Celsius. Under those conditions, we are going to have hydrogen bonds that are being disrupted, hydrophobic interactions between the nonpolar uh, side chains of amino acids. Whenever we're disrupting hydrogen bonds, understand that we are affecting the secondary structure which means that we're also going to affect the tertiary structure or quaternary structure of a given protein. To give you examples, um, as you can see, cooking food was already explained, but for example, autoclaving surgical instruments is one of the ways in which esterilization happens because the idea is that the proteins um, that are there or if there's bacteria that has protein in it because of denaturing that will lead to killing the bacteria the second denaturing agent that we have present as an example is going to be the use of acids and bases as you can see here hydrogen bonds between polar R groups are going to be disrupted which means that also um, in addition to that, we can also disrupt salt bridges. Now, salt bridges, understand that specifically these are going to be part of the tertiary structure of the protein. But as you can see, the hydrogen bonds between polar R groups, this can also be part of the tertiary structure. So if you have a denaturing agent that affects the tertiary structure, that can affect, if it is present in a protein, the quaternary structure. An example of that will be lactic acid from bacteria, which actually denatures milk proteins when yogurt and cheese is prepared. Another denaturing agent can be organic compounds. And as you can see, organic compounds can affect hydrophobic interactions. When it comes to hydrophobic interactions, remember that that is part of how a protein is folded. So we can envision how this can affect secondary, etc. you know, the higher order structures of a protein. But when, it, when we think about it, these interactions are going to be very important. Now, an example of how organic compounds can disrupt um, protein structure is when ethanol or isopropyl alcohol is utilized to disinfect wounds or prepare skin for injections. Another denaturing agent is going to be heavy metals. Now understand that this is a very specific example because heavy metal is 
basically cause when there is mercury or lead poisoning so this is very specific um, this is a problem that if we look in our society is water contamination so several years ago we know that in the state of Michigan this was a big problem now how does metal poisoning actually affect the bonds or, or which bonds are disrupted in proteins it specifically targets the disulfide bonds in proteins by forming ionic bonds so understand that these heavy metal ions when they are going to be interacting with the cysteine residues this is another way in which we have that a metal interaction that we discuss in the tertiary structure so this will be a way to affect the tertiary structure of a protein in any higher order structural level lastly we have agitation in terms of agitation understand that the bonds that are disrupted are going to be the hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions and what happens overall is that in this process we're going to be stretching the polypeptide and disrupting any stabilizing interaction as you know if we're affecting hydrogen bonding we are going to be affecting the secondary structure tertiary so on and so forth because remember that if you affect the secondary you're going to affect the rest of the structural levels for proteins now where do we see an example of this well as you can see from the table whenever whipped cream is made or whenever you have egg whites and you put them what is called in in the kitchen like cloud consistency because you are agitating them to make them um, foam up that is a way in which the specifically the proteins in the egg whites are going to be denatured and that is one of the techniques that is utilized in the kitchen to make meringues the last section that it is important in this chapter that we must discuss is protein folding dynamics understand that when it comes to taking into account all of this information modern computer techniques have been able to actually predict protein structure this is very very useful in the laboratory it is um, so useful nowadays that just Think about the ability that we have as scientists to predict protein structure and function. So you can imagine that in the world of medicine, if you have a protein of interest, and let's say that that protein is causing a disease, because you can predict its structure, just because we know the structure of 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 a protein that is within the same family this can lead for us to make better estimates and to explore an area of science in which we can create good medication now I want to acknowledge that in this process of protein folding this takes a long time this is complex but I just wanted to illustrate briefly how this whole system works now as you can see the flow chart that is in the bottom left corner this t gives you of an idea of how protein structure prediction actually works scientifically at first you're going to have a protein sequence then as you can see we have a database of a similarity check what this means is that within our computer we're going to be looking at the archives to see do we have proteins that have a similar sequence so at times this is referred as to doing homology searches and understand that this team this term basically means we're going to look at things that are similar in terms of the amino acids as you can see you're going to look at alignment and based on alignment then you're going to think okay do they align or do they do not align based on that as you can see you have to make more decisions you have to do comparative modeling 
maybe look at protein families analysis so as you can see this is just illustrating how complex protein structure can be but be mindful that even though this process will take time I wanted to give you some examples of actual proteins and their predicted and even though I don't have the name of the proteins here and I just have the ribbon um, illustrations of the proteins if you look at the images that are on the right side those are the predicted structures and if we compare it to the actual one when it was isolated and detected they are very similar so the main point of this area is just to understand that modern computing techniques have been able to allow us to predict protein structure this whole area takes a long time but understand that for many proteins to date this has been a good resource in order to find the structure of a protein for studies in science